Let me, let me start by thanking the organizers and uh, praising them for having had this initiative last year. So I, I had the opportunity, of course, to write them an email and already tell them this, but uh, I thought this was a great idea. Um, and uh, it's, it's very uncommon that we can get together a bunch of reaction theorists that uh, share their passion for reaction theory and want to discuss this and then have some experimentalists that are brave to join our discussions. Um, and I had a lot of fun through the whole seminar series last, last year, and I'm continuing to having fun this year. So I'm very happy that this uh, bunch of young people had this idea and put this together. Um, I'd also like to start by uh, honoring uh, Mahir Hussain. Uh, so Mahir left us in 2019 but he'll be remembered for a long time. Uh, many of us uh, benefited from all the seeds that he would place in our minds as, as we discuss things. And uh, I'm very happy that uh, EPJA ha will have a topical issue uh, as a tribute uh, to his work. So I just pointed it out so people can watch out for that. That's, uh, that will be coming. Okay, so today, actually, I'm not talking about anything that I collaborated with Mahir on. It's a very different topic. It'll be about the uh, Bayesian analysis of reactions. Uh, but I'll start uh, with providing some context. I know this group of people probably already is motivated for reactions, but nevertheless, I'll highlight why uh, reactions are of astrophysical relevance. Um, and then I'll, I'll want to discuss what are the sources of uncertainties that we're facing and then talk about the ABC of Bayesian analysis uh, and then talk about some statistical tools that might help in exploring uh, the, the extraction of the optical potential. And then finally, I'll wrap up with some perspectives, including the non-locality and optical potentials and some other challenges and opportunities. So uh, we've all been very excited uh, with the, the LIGO results and the neutrons and, and, and the kilonova that have been observed after that. Uh, neutron star mergers are now known to actually have uh, produced heavy elements. And uh, we know that there's a whole runaway of neutron captures, rapid neutron captures that take place very far away from stability to generate these uh, isotopes, these heavy isotopes. Uh, these neutron captures are neutrons on unstable nuclei. And if you actually were to try and measure that, you'd, you'd, you'd face a, a really difficult challenge uh, because you can't make targets out of either of them. And so un indirect methods are typically used and reactions uh, like transfer reactions offer a very good alternative because cross sections are large they allow you to measure them, and then you can extract from, for example, the DP reaction, the, neutron, the, the, the constraints necessary for the N gamma. And we've actually, in the series, had already a seminar dedicated to this. Yuta Escher gave a very nice talk on a recent application of the surrogate method, where from the DP gamma on molybdenum 95, they measure the N gamma. Um, but, and so I'm not going to say any more about that. I'm just going to refer to, to that talk if you want to go back and watch it. Uh, on the proton-rich uh, side, we also have a reason to be doing reactions. And that's, uh, of course, for Novi, many of the relevant reactions happen for the proton-rich nuclei. And there you have proton capture rates on these proton-rich nuclei. And of course, you can make a proton target. So that is possible. But there, the, in the gamma window, the reactions are extremely low. So it's very difficult to measure directly. And so again, you can use indirect methods, like, for instance, a DN probe that will contain within it the information for the P gamma. And so this has been applied actually widely. And uh, there's an, a recent, relatively recent example uh, of uh, uh, applying this to the nickel 56 P gamma um, using the Gratina array for the gammas and the S800 for particle ID at the NSCL. 
And what the experimentalists measure is a experimental total cross section. Theorists can predict this. And then from uh, uh, making the comparison between theory and experiment, you can extract the uh, proton widths that then constrain the P gamma rate. And so again, this is, I, I'm not gonna spend too much time on this. It's just to illustrate that uh, these are essential probes these reactions are essential probes to inform the rates needed for astrophysics. So uh, having said yet nothing about the reaction models themselves, what are the sources of uncertainty? So the first thing to grapple with is this mapping from the many body to the few body. Most of the reactions we're interested in this context, the stuff that I just mentioned, are uh, of such complexity that you can't treat it ab initio. So what you do is you simplify the problem to a few body problem. And so the first thing you have to ask yourself is can we solve this few body problem accurately? Are there uncertainties in solving this few body problem? Uh, because this itself might be a challenge solving it with scattering boundary conditions. Then the second is when you do this uh, mapping, you introduce another level of effectiveness in your theory uh, how much uncertainty are in those effective interactions. And then of course, you've, you've made a mapping, a simplification of, of this problem. Uh, what have you left out? And, and what are the uncertainties associated with what you've left out? I mean, be it a three, if you think about it as target excitation, a three body force or other channels, these are things that you've left out of your model and could be introducing further uncertainty. So uh, I want to uh, assure that typically when I prepare sort of an overview talk on a topic, I go back to talks I've given years ago, just to, to see what did I say so many years ago. And I ended up in this Verena talk from June 2012. I don't know if there are many people in the audience that have been to Verena, this is a great, so this nuclear reactions uh, uh, conference in Verena, is, is really very, very nice for many reasons. And uh, again, it's reaction theorists that get together and get to discuss things. And um, in, this, in this particular one, I was talking about this mismatch between uh, knockout reactions and transfer reactions. Uh, and, and this plot here that is, has now become extremely famous and you've seen it many, many times. Here, it's a plot from 20, uh, 2009. So a, many years ago, we already were talking about this uh, and it shows uh, the dissatisfaction ratio. It's basically the experimental uh, uh, spectroscopic factor over the Shell model predicted spectroscopic factor. So that ratio uh, as a function of um, the, the separation energy of the proton minus the separation energy of the neutron. And you see that there's a strong dependence on this variable in knockout, and there's very little dependence on transfer, if you use transfer as a probe. And so I was very intrigued by this, like many of us, and I decided, well, what about the error bars? What, what about, you know, how uncertain are those dots in this plot? And so uh, I started looking at it and I did this work in collaboration with Ernest Del Tuva and Jun Yong. And uh, what, what we started with, with was the adiabatic wave approximation, which was what was being used by the experimentalists to analyze the data. We looked at some approximations that are done within that model. Then we used the FADIF uh, method and compared the FADIF method to the adiabatic. We looked at different ways of parameterizing the interaction, and we came up with a, uh, an estimated error for these various components. Okay, so we ended up with these error bars associated with theory that are represented here by green. Uh, and throughout this process, I got rather uh, unhappy. You know, my uh, uh, dissatisfaction ratio was getting larger with time because I realized that these numbers themselves had large uncertainties, depending on how I decided to uh, compare the, the two optical potentials or the two calculations for the and adiabatic, these numbers could have come out differently. And so my, my sense was that somehow the bar that should be represented here. So typically uh, the errors are just the, the experimental errors, but the bar that should be on top of, of both 
the knockout and the transfer uh, sh should probably be much wider and perhaps overlapping and therefore uh, we might be talking about a disagreement that isn't fully a disagreement. So um, I, it just got me thinking about how to calculate error bars in theory in a way that is not so ambiguous. So uh, let me now then uh, switch to Bayesian analysis and discuss how we can do this in a less ambiguous way than the way that I did it in, in 2011 or 20, 2012. So uh, coming back to these various uh, sources of uncertainty, for the sake of this talk, let's assume we can solve the few body scattering problem and there's no uncertainty there. Okay, uh, this is a different talk and I really uh, shouldn't talk about it now because I won't have time for everything. Uh, so let's assume that that problem can be solved accurately and that's not the source of our uncertainty. So then we still left with these other two uncertainties and I'm gonna call this first one the parametric uncertainties in our model. So we're going to parametrize these effective interactions in some way. And I'm gonna call these other uh, uh, channels or target excitations, et cetera, model uncertainties, things that are bad in our model. We've made approximations in the model. And so they're, they actually are things that we've left out of our model. So how, how do we prioritize these effective interactions? So they're optical potentials. We've had several of these seminars totally de dedicated to optical potentials. We know from theory that they are intrinsically non-local, L-dependent and energy dependent. And I want to stress this because this has nothing to do with whether you start off from an N N interaction that's local or non-local. So if you, even if you start from an N N interaction that is local, you will end up with an optical potential that is non-local, L-dependent, and energy-dependent. So that 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 comes from the anti-symmetrization and the uh, other degrees of freedom that you're not including in your problem. So the phenomenological approach, of course, is to try to simplify this to being local and now independent, and that generates a strong energy dependence in the, in the optical potential. And typically, you fit a large body of elastic scattering, extract the parameters for an assumed shape. And the assumed shape is of Wood-Saxon, and that is totally based on the fact that we know that the density distribution in the nucleus is of that sort. So you expect there to be a real part of the interaction that is attractive of that shape. And then because of everything else that gets pulled out of the elastic channel, then you're gonna have an imaginary component. And that imaginary component has usually two parts, one that is a volume term and one that is a surface term. And then of course, you'll still have a spin orbit and a Coulomb uh, interaction. So typically these are the free parameters in your fit to elastic scattering. And then you fit a set of elastic scattering data and extract your model parameters. And of course, people have been doing this for a long time. Uh, and and uh, it's coincidental that it's, it's, it comes in cycles of 20 years. So every 20 years, there'll be a, a major effort deriving a new global optical potential. Uh, Buketting and Greenlees undertook this challenge in 1969. Then the Chapel Hill group did this in 89 and Cunningham and De La Roche did this in uh, the 2000s. And uh, it gets better and better as, as you get more and more data, it gets better and better. But in any of these cases, we really don't know the uncertainties. So no matter uh, which one, if I decide I want to use one of these uh, global potentials and I wanna calculate an interaction between uh, the proton and beryllium 12 or the proton and silicon 34 uh, and I calculate these elastic cross sections, I don't know what the error bars are on those cross sections from that calculation. I don't know what the errors are on the parameters that I'm using. Uh, and so that, that is the essence of the ambiguity when we put an error bar and decide, okay, perhaps we just run a calculation with Chapel L89 and a calculation with Canel de la Roche and then put an error bar. It's very ambiguous and the error bar will have an error that may be larger than the error bar, if you follow what I'm saying. Um, okay, so then what we want is to be able to quantify these uncertainties in a more systematic way. Uh, Amy Lavelle actually gave a talk about a year ago on this, 
and uh, she walked you through the various steps, but I feel like I need to do it again because it might have, uh, for those of you that want, don't work on this all the time, it, you might not remember it anymore. And it's important to, to build up for what I'm gonna discuss next. So we develop a hypothesis, that's our model. In this case, it's the optical model, the way we're going to use this. Uh, we have a set of parameters that are intrinsic to the model that we've included. In this case, it's the parameters of the optical potential. And we know something about these parameters. We already know, you know, Connie and De La Roche has done tremendous work and Bukhari and Greenlees and Chapel Hill and I have given us a lot of information about what to expect from these parameters. So we can define priors that, in, that in, uh, encapsulate our knowledge about these parameters. Then we have to confront with reality. In this, in this case, there'll be elastic angular distributions typically or polarization data or some, some elastic form of data. And, and then we, we represent how our model is doing uh, in terms of function, a function that will tell us how well is my model when confronted with reality. And then we use a Markov chain Monte Carlo to sample parameter space and use Bayes theorem to construct the posterior distributions for these parameters and from them obtain confidence intervals for the observables. So that's the idea in a very sort of bird's eye view of the various steps involved. How do we set this up? We set this up concretely by defining prior distributions for each of the parameters that has a mean. In our case, we chose the mean to be the Bukhari and Greenlee's global parameter. And it, for all the calculations I'm showing here, the widths of the priors are quite broad. We put 100% of the mean because we don't want to bias the results towards the Bukhari and Greenlee's uh, initial parameterization. For the data, we use mock data generated by the Conan de la Roche global parameters with a 10% error. And I'll come back to this. I know that this is something that particularly the experimentalists feel uncomfortable about, that we'd like to have real data that is compared, but there isn't as much real data as one would like to be able to uh, make comparisons across the board. And so uh, in order to keep uh, the calibration correct, it, it is important to use mock data to test all these various tools that we're developing. And then finally, the likelihood is built on the assumption that all the data points are independent and the errors are normally distributed and therefore it's just the exponential of minus chi square over two. And so we have some error bars that we have in the theory, in the experiment. We have the, com the computation of our function, in this case, are the cross sections given by the optical model. We have the data and we construct our likelihood function. Um, the Markov chain Monte Carlo allows us to sample parameter, parameter space in a, in a, um, in a very uh, nice way, so an unbiased way. So we randomly pick parameter sets, we run the optical potential and calculate the likelihood, then we impose the metropolis hasting condition. If the new set is better than the old set by some random variable, then we keep it, otherwise we throw it away and we uh, accumulate statistics through the cycle in this random walk. And then, you know, you don't do just one random walk, you do a bunch of random walks and you put all of these together in order to construct ultimately what we call the posterior, the parameter posterior distributions. So for this case, let's say that we did some random walks and then we got a bunch of uh, results with different values for the potential parameters and the posterior distributions would look like this and it would tell me something about the mean of the potential and the width of the potential. And this is just like a test run, just to show you the sorts of things that you'd get. And once you have this, then you have a place to pull from to construct your observables and you can construct say 95% confidence bands by integrating over posteriors. Uh, and these confidence bands will actually be you know, they, they will supposedly represent how likely it is that you get all the data points within the band. So at, at the 95% confidence level, 95% of your data should fall in uh, the bands. 
Okay, so this is just to set up how we do the Bayesian Markov chain Monte Carlo and how we start calibrating, getting parameter distributions and getting uh, observables with error bars, with uh, uncertain, uh, it's not so much a, an error bar, but it is an uncertainty interval. So I uh, want to make a, a real point about this work that is now two years old already, but it's the comparison between the frequentist and the Bayesian. It is, um, th this was where we started. We thought, well, we've been doing chi-square minimization uh, for a very long time in this area. Uh, we, ha we could just use the chi-square function um, and assume uh, it's, uh, you know, everything is Gaussian distributed and, and, and extract error bars from uh, the behavior of a chi-square function around the minimum. And so if you do that, that was what we call the frequentist approach. And if you do a full Bayesian, your results end up not in the same place. The minimum looks alike, but the quantification of the errors look very different. And so here's a study that was done uh, where we looked at calcium 48 reactions. And here it's just the neutron at 12 MeV, the proton at 14 MeV, and the proton at 25 MeV. And uh, in this case, actually it's real data that is used. Uh, and what is compared is the elastic predictions, the elast uh, elastic angular distribution predictions. If you use the frequentist approach, which is the traditional approach of just doing chi-square minimization through finite differences, and the Bayesian approach, which is what I just described. And you see immediately that the uh, orange band is larger than the blue band. And if that's quantified here, uh, this epsilon is basically the width of that band. And you see that the Bayesian is significantly larger, uh, always, no matter what you do, it's always larger than the frequentist. Uh, so then we did the litmus test and saw what is the actual empirical coverage of these two methods. So this is the percent in the confidence interval. Uh, and this is the experimental data that actually falls in, in that interval. And so if, if all was good, then everything would be in this black line. And what you see is things are not on that black line. And typically the frequentist undershoots so the errors are too small. And the Bayesian overshoots, the errors tend to be a bit large. However, at the large confidence level, which is typically where we work, we, we work at the 95% confidence level typically, uh, the Bayesian really does represent what is going on in the system, whereas the frequentist tends to always underestimate the error bars. And so that kind of tells us that what the assumptions, the normal assumptions that were going into the frequentist approach are just not correct. Uh, the other thing that uh, was surprising to us when we did this were the correlations. So in this plot, we showed just a scatter plot, a correlation plot for the two methods, the frequentist in blue and the Bayesian in orange. And if you have strong correlations between two parameters, you will get these thin ellipses, which is typically what you get, for instance, here. There is a strong correlation between V and R, two parameters in the real interaction. So you see very strong correlations between those. On the other hand, if you get something like this, then you see no correlations. You know that basically these two are uncorrelated. And what we found is that uh, the frequentist, there are some correlations that we know from textbooks, that were there and that somehow are not reproduced in the Bayesian. And so the, the, it was telling us that some of the correlations that we were getting were a result of how we were looking at the problem with this sort of normal approximation. And that once you actually allowed your distributions to be what they are with long tails and you know, like this that don't look normal at all, then you might get a different perspective. Um, and that was an important realization uh, that is, sti is still sort of being digested. 
So then once you have these, you can propagate them to any other observable that you have interest in. And I started out with an example of DP reactions. So we propagated these into DP reactions and we calculated the uncertainty bands coming from frequentist and the Bayesian approach. And again, not surprisingly, of course, the Bayesian predicts a larger uncertainty than the frequentist. And again, the data seems to say that the, at the high confidence level, the empirical coverage uh, predicted by the Bayesian is on, on point where the frequentist is underestimating it. So the, the conclusion of this comparison is that uh, one should be a little weary of using the frequentist approach to estimate uncertainties because it really wasn't meant to do that. It was meant to find a minimum. It doesn't have in it the tool set to determine uncertainties unless everything is normally distributed. Uh, the Bayesian approach doesn't require that. It, it obviously produces these posterior distributions and from them you just, you just pull uh, all the information you need. So the bad news is that the uncertainties are larger than we previously thought. And this really does call for ways to reduce the optical model uncertainties. So uh, I wanna mention that the set of tools that we're using was actually part of the PhD thesis of Amy Lavelle. Uh, she's now moved on of course, but uh, we're still using this set of tools. And for those of you in this audience, as I know many of you use Fresco, these are wrappers built around Fresco. And so eventually our hope is that we will be able to uh, expand this to be able to do much more than just optical model analysis. So now we've moved on and we're trying to use other statistical tools to inform how can we reduce these uh, model uncertainties, sorry, these uh, optical model uncertainties. And uh, Manuel Catacora Rios did a seminar roughly a year ago again, uh, where he, he was looking into uh, how to reduce uncertainties. I'm gonna call it by hand. So we looked at uh, let's let's do a calculation with only forward angle data. Let's do a calculation with backward and forward. Let's do a calculation with less amount of data and see the differences. And so we were sort of rerunning uh, the whole machinery and trying to make predictions for the uncertainty intervals, uh, the confidence intervals, and trying to determine from that, you know, what was needed and what was not needed. And, and that's one way to go about it. But there are other tools that we can explore to inform what needs to be measured, for example, uh, to constrain better this parameter versus that parameter. Or uh, tools that can tell us what model actually has more information given a certain observable. And so the, these are the things that I'd like to touch upon uh, in the time that I have, which I have to check because I don't want to go over time for sure. So one of the questions that we were trying to answer is uh, what observable would give us a better constraint? So last, for those of us living in the rare isotope era, of course, there aren't many options for polarization data available. Uh, but for those of you that uh, were around in the 70s and the 80s, you know there, 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 there's plenty of data in various, uh, on various stable nuclei for polarization. And so the question really is, does polarization data offer better constraints for the elastic, uh, for the optical model parameters? And so we, we ran through the, the, the system and, and calculated uh, confidence intervals based on uh, elastic scattering data and confidence intervals based on polarization data. And uh, we extracted uh, optical, uh, uh, these are the means of the optical model parameters that were extracted for two energies. Uh, these are the confidence intervals that are predicted. Blue is for polarization, orange is for elastic. Uh, and you know, not unsurprising, if you fitted, so if you fitted the uh, polarization, then of course you do better in the polarization. 
if you fitted the elastic, then you'd do better on the elastic. You know, that's not a surprising thing. Um, but the minimum looks very similar. So the minimum that these two things reach are very similar. Uh, and so we said, okay, we can't really decide between these two sets. They seem to have the same information. Um, just as a, an aside, if you use real data, you get qualitatively the same. It's the same sort of results that you get. So whether um, you use elastic or you use polarization, you end up in very similar minimum and you end up with uncertainty bands that are of similar magnitude. So we wanted to go further and see, are there tools that can give us information uh, of you know, what is the information content of the, of the data, of the model given the data? And the Bayesian evidence is such a, a tool. It essentially just integrates over full model space, the likelihood function, the prior and the likelihood function and so essentially, if your model is so bad that it never agrees with the data, the likelihood is zero, you end up with a Bayesian evidence of zero. The better you're able to describe your data in a wider range of your parameter space, the more information you accumulate, the larger your Bayesian evidence. And so this is a tool that is often used to compare models, to compare, we wanted to use it to compare data. And so we actually have been uh, looking at a bunch of different uh, different reactions, so on reactions on calcium 48 and lead, and just doing a base factor where we're looking at the evidence for uh, the results with the elastic angular distribution and the polarization data. And we find that this ratio uh, is never very large. And uh, if, if you base yourself on uh, information theory, uh, and this reference here is from uh, statistics, uh, you see that uh, the language they use is it's not worth more than a bare mention. So, you know, it's not that one set of data really contains a lot more information than another. So the other tool that we've looked at uh, we call it sensitivities, different groups will call it different things. And essentially it's the derivative of the parameter with respect to the observable. So it's, it's different than the derivative of the observable with respect to the parameter, right? So it's not like we're changing the parameter and seeing how much the observable is changing, which is typically what people do. It's the other way around is, it's basically telling us what should we be measuring really well in order to get a constraint in this particular parameter. Uh, and and uh, we've done this for a bunch of cases and here are some examples for the calcium 48 and neutrons at 12 MeV, the protons at 12 and the protons at 21. And what is plotted here, so, so this is like a contour plot, what is plotted here in the vertical are the various parameters that are considered and in the horizontal, uh, to the, the, so there's a separation line. So to the left are elastic angular distributions. To the right are uh, polarization, T11 distributions. And this is binned up in angle, in angle, you know, bins of about five degrees angle. And so what you see is that throughout the angular distribution and the elastic, you are essentially sensitive to two parameters. You know, in, in terms of these sensitivities, you pinning down the uh, imaginary surface depth and the, and the diffuseness depth. At this energy, at the, for this reaction, the elastic scattering is being sensitive to essentially those two parameters. And different angles will show different sensitivities. Uh, the same goes for the polarization data, actually. So if we now look at the higher energy case, here you pin down a wider range of parameters. You have a higher energy and it's not surprising that this uh, um, an ability to, to now start looking at the, the volume term. And so you, you, depending on the angles, you might pin down 
better the, the depth of the real part and the radius of the real part, etc. So this tool really is a very useful tool if we're trying to determine, given a parameter set, what sort of observable will actually produce the most constraint on those parameters. So we can use this, here we were using this as a motivation to compare elastic versus polarization. Uh, but you could also use this to compare to different levels. And here's a, an extreme toy situation that we've been playing with. And that is a model that only includes the surface imaginary term and a model that only includes the volume imaginary term. Can the data distinguish between these two? And so this, this is the, the whole calibration per, uh, process is run for uh, calcium 48 protons at 65 MeV. In these two models, uh, posteriors are obtained, confidence bands are obtained. And then from those, you can pull to determine the sensitivities. And uh, again, it, you, know, you get some sensitivity, but you get different sensitivities for the two models. And the sensitivities are different in terms of angle. So depending on the angle, at the, in this case, you're more forward, in this case, you're more backward, it's sensitive to different parts of the angular distribution. And what's not notable here is that your Bayesian factor is actually quite large, where the volume uh, model seems to contain more information than the surface. So really what we would like to know is whether we can use these to now uh, discriminate between reaction theories. So this, this is work that we published in this uh, sort of review article in JFSG, uh, where there were predictions done in DWBA and predictions done in, in the adiabatic model for a DP reaction. We saw that the predictions were considerably different. And the question really is, if we now uh, compare to data, can we discriminate between these two models? And we hope that using things like the Bayes factor, we will be able to discriminate between these two in a, in a less ambiguous way, rather than I like it or I don't like it. Okay, so I have uh, 10 more minutes and I'll quickly just switch gears to talk about non-locality which then connects to some of the challenges and opportunities that I see in the future of this field. So we've done, a lot of us, it's not just us, but a lot of groups have gotten an interest in non-locality and the non-locality effects of the optical potential. So we understand that optical potentials should be intrinsically non-local. And if we were to include this non-locality, it would have an effect in observables. So we've done a whole bunch of things and there's nothing we've looked at that shows that there's no effect. There's always some sort of effect. It can be a small effect, it can be a large effect, but there's some sort of effect. Here's just an example of the sort of effect that you get. Uh, here is the adiabatic prediction for DN on lead and you, you get different shapes, different magnitudes for a given reaction. And so this is not an exception. This is kind of what you see. You get some differences by including non-locality in these optical potentials. So um, really perhaps we should be looking at a global non-local optical potential. And of course, Perry and Buck developed this in the 60s. Uh, in his case, they basically fitted lead <laughs> in one case, and they were able to predict a whole bunch of things. They actually did surprisingly well for the, the fit that they did. Um, and uh, more recently, uh, a group has uh, revisited this and developed a, 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 a proton interaction as well as a neutron interaction. Uh, and also did such a fit. And the characteristic between these two is that they're energy independent. And you know, as I pointed out in the beginning, the optical potential should be intrinsically, you know, from theory should be non-local, L-dependent and energy dependent. So all these things in principle should be there. And we looked at this uh, a while back and 
we said, well, you know, the, there's a strong energy dependence in local, all of the local phenomenological potentials. For example, we, we have here the Bacchidian green leaves is a strong energy dependence appearing both in the real volume and surface. And so we took a bunch of data uh, on, an, on three different targets for a wider range of energies. Uh, we assume the same Gaussian non-locality that these other two parameterizations had, and then try to determine, is the energy dependence needed? Do we really get rid of the energy dependence? And uh, it turns out that in the real part, it doesn't seem like it's needed, but in the imaginary part, the data seems to need that energy dependence. And so uh, uh, these two highlights here are values that are non-zero and that correspond to the uh, coefficients in front of an energy dependent term. So the, the, the point is that a, an, an energy dependent non-local potential global would be a very useful thing. Now we'd like to do this with Bayesian statistics so then we know what the uncertainty associated with the potential is. Uh, and that becomes a little difficult because these computations are no longer uh, very fast. So there are many opportunities in the next five years. Uh, they all involve going beyond the simplest sort of optical model type things that we've been doing. Uh, they involve non-locality in the optical potential. They involve excitations, breakup or coupled reaction channels in the description of the reactions. And they would, if we do this in this framework, they, they would allow us to quantify parametric uncertainties very well. And then we'd still have to tackle model uncertainties. And eventually we'd like to be able to mix models because we know that some models are better at this, some models are better at that. And if we have uh, the Bayesian framework actually provides us with ways of mixing the best of two worlds. And so we could do model mixing. And so all these are opportunities for us in the next few years. The challenge, of course, is that these are very heavy computations. And so one of the things that we need to, to do is develop what we in this field call emulators. Well, other people have called it emulators. I just call it emulators because everybody else does. That emulate the problem without actually having the same dimensionality. So it reduces the dimensionality of the problem. So if, if I have a complicated CDCC calculation, if I only have to do three or four of those to train an emulator, and then I run the emulator millions of times to get all the statistics I need for the Bayesian, then I've got a way around uh, this computational challenge. And uh, our group is actually, a, a number of us in the group are looking at the eigenvector continuation method. There was some uh, work done by Dick Fernstein and collaborators where they apply this for scattering and a number of people in the group are now trying to pursue this uh, in the context of uncertainty quantification in the Bayesian world. So uh, the, the big view of this is that there's all these different elements uh, that this Bayesian analysis allows us uh, allow, allows us to, to, to connect to. So I talked about the uncertainty quantification aspect that would contain both a parameter uncertainty and a model uncertainty. I talked about the emulation and how that would optimize the calculations. Uh, I talked about using tools to do model comparison, which model is optimum for uh, describing data. And then that can lead us to model mixing uh, getting the best of two models. And then of course, when you do data comparison, you might actually want to know what data contains more information to constrain your system. And then eventually you might get to experimental design, which is design the experiment that is best to constrain the model that you have. So this is sort of a, a, a very ambitious sort of framework. Uh, and there's different tools that one can use within each one of these boxes. I just want to close by mentioning BAND. So BAND stands for the Bayesian Analysis of Nuclear Dynamics. It's a collaboration that's funded by NSF. Uh, I'm part of it and there's an, a number of nuclear physicists, statisticians and computational scientists that are part of this. 
And ultimately, uh, there will be a set suite of codes that will enable the community to use Bayesian analysis in nuclear dynamics more broadly. Um, and then also, I need to mention EFRIB. Of course, EFRIB is going to produce a plethora of data uh, with exotic beams. Uh, right from the start, there'll be a bunch of primary beams. And those primary beams will allow us to produce these showers of exotic beams. And so it's very, very exciting to, to be in a time where not only can we uh, be moving forward on the um, re theory part and the statistics part of the uncertainty problem, but also have a better set of data to constrain, particularly away from stability. So what, what's most exciting to me is that many of these uh, experiments will allow for such good intensities that you can do reactions now with lots of things far from stability with good statistics. So in closing, let me just say that I hope I've convinced you that reactions offer a versatile tool for extracting uh, input to many things, including astrophysics. Reaction theory, of course, is an, a very important element to that, but uncertainty quantification is equally important and an essential ingredient if we want to know whether the theory even agrees or doesn't with the data. Uh, Bayesian analysis offers many avenues, and I think there'll be really a very promising future of collaboration with experiment in this realm. So I have to thank all my collaborators on this project. Currently, there, there are a group of people that are uh, working with me on uncertainty quantification. Uh, and I thank all of you for your patience uh, zooming in today. And I'll be more than happy to, to discuss. I think I've left enough time for questions.